Okay, okay so I'd like to turn the I'd like to turn the meeting over to um, Sharon Mullen, who is um, going to uh, introduce herself and uh, kick off the program. So Sharon, go ahead. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chris had mentioned earlier uh, during the initial part of the meeting that I had returned to the fold of the Hampton Dems, um, and that's true. But part of the reason for that is I had moved away for about 15 years and I'm just coming back. Um, I, I don't know any of you, <laughs> I'll get to. Um, and I suspect that you probably know some of our speakers a lot better than I do. But we're recording the session tonight so that it is available for others in town and out to view. So it's going to maybe be a little bit more formal um, than, than you would normally have in the Hampton Dems meeting. So tonight, we're going to talk about climate change and how it may impact Hampton. And uh, climate change may seem far away, whether you're thinking about Glasgow or polar bears on icebergs or fossils in the Russian tundra, freezes in Texas or fires in Oregon, but Hampton is not immune. I don't know if we have any Hampton Beach business owners joining us tonight, but they could tell you that the extreme weather caused by climate change over this past summer really impacted them in their bottom lines. Um, remember our drought? <clears throat> June was scorching hot and July was drenching wet and some of our roads were underwater. We are all here proud residents of New Hampshire's little bit of a seacoast. I'm still explaining to people where I used to live um, what Hampton, New Hampshire's seacoast is. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, you know, all of us would love our access to the ocean and don't wanna move inland. But we also probably learned early on what happens to a sandcastle when the tide comes in. And those tides will continue to flow, but they're going to start encroaching our roads, homes, wells, and lives from a higher starting point because our sea level is rising. There are facts and lots of opinions about what causes climate change and what to do about it. Tonight, we're going to focus on the impact it could have on life in Hampton. We're gonna talk about how it could impact you and our town and what to do about it. So we're going to start with a star-studded panel of speakers, giving each a short perspective, um, followed by several of our community leaders and elected officials who are going to give even shorter presentations. Um, and with a little luck and a lot of discipline, we'll then have about 30 minutes of questions. So um, please send any questions along in the chat box. Um, and Jay Dine is going to kick us off this evening and there couldn't be a better way to start. Jay serves, as, uh, serves Hampton as vice chair of the Hampton Conservation Commission, member of the Master Plan Committee and the Hampton Harbor Bridge Public Advisory Committee. He's an organizer of the Coastal Conservation Commission's Roundtable and a board member of the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. Jay is also the founder and president of the Seabrook Hampton Estuary Alliance. Jay is going to start us off tonight with an introduction about impacts of flooding on our community. Jay? Thank you, Sharon. And good evening, everybody. And thank you all for inviting me to speak with you this evening. Um, my focus is going to be on sea level rise, tidal flooding, and a few of the many efforts that are being undertaken to help Hampton deal with, if not mitigate, those impacts. Uh, I have a lot of ground to cover in a few minutes, but there will be time, as I understand it, for questions afterwards. Uh, to set the stage for the year 2021, uh, NOAA has forecasted just over 200 high tides in our area that are at nine feet or higher. At nine feet, some streets along the salt marsh will start to flood. NOAA has also told us to expect almost 40 high tides at 10 feet or higher. And at that height, some properties will become inundated and parts of some local roads may become impassable. At the end of this week and into the weekend, we will experience the fall king tide when tides are traditionally at their highest, even absent any storm activity. And if you travel around Hampton Beach, you'll see, you'll likely see this weekend that there's a good chance that there will be flooding on Kings Highway, Island Path, Glade Path, Hobson Avenue, and other streets along Hampton Beach. So how is Hampton dealing with tidal flooding? I'm going to try this evening to give you a brief snapshot of some of the activities that are taking place to help us deal with this, uh, this situation. The Hampton Department of Public Works received a substantial grant to study and develop solutions for the chronic flooding in two neighborhoods. In the Green and Gentian Street area off Kings Highway, the problem is that the storm drains cannot move enough water fast enough, combined with a water table that is chronically high because of the increasing levels of water in Meadow Pond, which is right behind those streets. 
groundwater rise accompanies sea level rise, especially this close to the coast. So there is less room for stormwater to infiltrate into the ground. Um, in the other neighborhood, which is west of Ashworth, Ashworth Avenue, the issue is low-lying streets and higher tides, which is not a good combination. Some suggest that those streets are sinking because they were built on filled salt marsh. There is a reason Ashworth, Ashworth Avenue used to be called Marsh Road. DPW's engineering firm has created a 72-page document that details the work done to analyze the current situation and proposes nine alternative solutions with pros and cons for each. And I'll provide you, I believe through Sharon, thank you, uh, with the link to that document so you can take a look at it. Um, the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Team, or CHAT, was created in 2019 and has been an ongoing effort with funding through the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance via grants from the uh, New Hampshire DES Coastal Program. CHAT was established to study the flooding issues in Hampton, learn in what ways tidal flooding has changed in recent years, consider what options are available to deal with those issues, and research how other coastal communities have dealt with similar issues. CHAT is made of representatives of every board and committee and commission in, Ham in Hampton, as well as the deputy director of, of uh, public works, the town planner, and local residents. Earlier this year, CHAT issued a draft lift list of 19 recommendations ranging from creating funding streams to deal with issues related to tidal flooding, updating local ordinances to encourage more resilient future development, creating a new staff position to work with planning, DPW, building and conservation to ensure a coordinated approach to dealing with sea level rise and floodplain issues, and educational efforts to help local residents learn what they can do themselves to help make their own properties more resilient. CHAT is currently working to help implement some of those recommendations. The next item, the town planner has received funding from the Piscataqua Region's Estuary Partnership to explore modifications to some of the town's ordinances that will include the risk from sea level rise in planning future development and redevelopment. These modifications, when implemented, will help to protect current and future occupants of those properties from the impacts of sea level rise. Incidentally, this effort supports one of the recommendations that came from CHAT, one of those 19 recommendations. Uh, the last effort I'm going to mention this evening um, has to do with FEMA grants that are available to help homeowner, homeowners elevate their structures or relocate out of harm's way if the risks from sea level rise have become too much from them. These grants have to be applied for and overseen by a municipality. Individual property owners cannot apply directly to FEMA for this funding. And Hampton does not have the capacity to oversee the application for and management of these grants. So the Rockingham Planning Commission is exploring how they can manage that process for the town of Hampton. Many property owners have said that they would gladly elevate their structures if there were funding to help with the expense. And it is expected that voluntary relocations will become the best option for other property owners as tides continue to encroach. So the role that RPC is looking to take on in Hampton will provide more options to help our at-risk property owners. Going back a little bit in regard to that DPW engineering study I referenced a few minutes ago, two of the highly rated alternative solutions that were recommended there were structural elevations and voluntary relocations. So it's all connected. So yes, we do have some problems caused by sea level rise, but we should all take some comfort in knowing that the issues are being taken quite seriously in Hampton and that local and regional organizations are taking significant steps to help, help, to help Hampton become more resilient now and into our future. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. So Mindy Messner will be our next speaker. Mindy is a licensed geologist in New Hampshire and Maine. She holds a master's degree in clinical and translational science from Georgetown University. The combination allows her to assess public health outcomes from environmental exposure. Mindy has operated a small woman-owned environmental consulting business for more than 20 years. The insights gained from her years as a business owner have impacted her commitment to sound legislation that supports the backbone of our state's economy, which is our small businesses, while protecting public health. 
Mindy has served as a state representative in the New Hampshire House and is the co-founder of New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance and New Hampshire Science and Public Health. Mindy will tell us about the impact of rising sea levels on our drinking water. Mindy? Thanks so much. Um, thanks for the intro and nice to see all of you. Great to be with Hampton again. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the public health impacts and why um, it's so important as we see the effects of climate change to protect our drinking water and specifically here in Hampton and on the seacoast. Um, as many of you know, um, I've talked a lot about the cancer issues. I'm part of the um, original cancer task force for the seacoast cancer cluster on the seacoast and the commissions that sort of continue to work on these issues across the state. Um, the reason I do that is uh, when I started to really look at these issues, I realized that New Hampshire really has high rates of cancer. Um, here on the seacoast, we not only have a double pediatric cancer cluster, um, but we also have the highest rates of pediatric cancer in the nation in New Hampshire. We have the highest rate of breast cancer. We have the highest rate of esophageal cancer and the highest rate of bladder cancer. And the NIH estimates that about 85 to 90% of those cancers could be prevented um, and most of them are environmentally triggered. So with environmental triggers, like um, in particular, <clears throat> contaminated drinking water contributes to the high rates of cancer we see in the state. So I've done a lot of policy work um, here in the state, but also advocacy work trying to help people understand how important it is to protect our drinking water. Um, here in Hampton and on the seacoast, about 40% of the residents have their own private drinking water wells and about 56% of the people get their water supplied from a large water supplier like Aquarian. Um, but all of these uh, water supplies, mostly on the seacoast are groundwater derived. So we have to protect our drinking water and the groundwater. And as we see sea level rise, um, we're gonna see threats to our drinking water as the water comes up. Um, there are, there have been in the past a couple of boil water um, events here in Hampton that were concerning not only to me, but Representative Edgar and I worked together on these issues and we have to really work at um, ways to effectively manage those um, events and to let people know that their water isn't safe when, it, when there are events like that that happen. But as you can see on the left-hand screen, this is Route 1A in Rye um, a couple of years ago during one of the winter storm events, you can see the, white, the waves rushing over Route 1A um, and that's what's happening um, here on the seacoast throughout Hampton as well. And so when that happens, not only do we have overland flow, but we have water coming up from underneath as Jay mentioned, and that makes it hard for us to protect our drinking water. We get, we get less and less clean, safe drinking water when these events happen. And over time when sea level rise, the groundwater is already also rising underneath the ground. And so that's why it's so important to protect what drinking water we have. Um, we um, have chemicals that will be spilled when events like this happen that threaten our drinking water. We also have droughts that are happened, um, ha happening and increasingly um, frequently. And those all affect the quantity of safe drinking water. So these two issues, drinking water and climate change are inextricably li linked together. Um, this is just a cartoon I found, which I thought a lot of times people have a hard time understanding why it's so important with sea level rise to protect our groundwater. And this is on the left side, you see what's typically happening when you have a drinking water well on the, the uh, column that goes down into the fresh water. But you can see how when the salt water comes up, that affects the supply of uh, clean, safe drinking water because the sea level also rises in those wells. So anybody that has a well here in Hampton and on the seacoast should be worried about sea level rise and protecting the quality of their drinking water as well. As the aquarium wells, they're all, they'll all be subject to this as well. So a couple of things have been happening in the last few years. Um, we've really um, been working on a lot of commissions to work on some of these tough issues like the Seacoast Drinking Water Commission, the Seacoast Pediatric Cancer Commission. Uh, there's also another commission with uh, Senator Tom Sherman, who's I think gone uh, chairs now, which is looking at ways to um, uh, prevent cancer, uh, getting the systems we need in place to track drinking water and cancer issues in the state of New Hampshire and prevent cancer. Um, and so here's a list of some of the things we accomplished over the last few years. Um, we now have a much more strict uh, drinking water standard for arsenic in the state of New Hampshire. We have very strict levels for lead um, and PFAS, which are these uh, Teflon-like um, chemicals that 
have come to the forefront of most of the news we have um, for the strictest in the nation. For those, we also have the strictest MTBE and some of the other things, but a couple of big, I'll see in the yellow there, a big issue we still need to work on here, and I think Rep. Edgar would, would agree, is uh, emergency procedures to notify people here in the state when their water isn't safe to drink. So I think I'm out of my time right now, and um, turn it back over to Sharon. Thanks, Mindy. Um, so I, I have sad news to share that our next speaker, Roger Stevenson from the Union of Concerned Science, this will not be able to join us tonight. Um, there was a death in his family and he is tending to, to that. Um, Rob Werner will then be our next speaker. Rob is the New Hampshire State Director for the League of Conservation Voters, a national advocacy organization that works to turn environmental values into national, state, and local priorities. Rob has extensive experience in the healthcare sector working in the private, government, and nonprofit areas. Rob is a graduate of the University of Vermont and earned an MBA from Suffolk University, along with certificates from the Harvard Kennedy School in state and local government, as well as climate change and energy policy. Rob has the Herculean task of representing some of what Roger would have been talking about, which is the impact, the economic, excuse me, impacts of climate change. Um, he will be wrapping up the formal portion of our presentation and also offering insights to state and local political action impacting climate change. Rob? Thank you, glad to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, my other hat, uh, so some of you know, is that I serve on the city council in Concord and I chair our energy and environment committee. So I'm very involved in the sort of local aspects and local action around climate, clean energy, development of renewable energy. Um, I would recommend a book to you all if you're not familiar with it um, called The Water Will Come by Jeff Goodell. I was fortunate a few years ago to be able to attend a presentation that Jeff gave and it was quite sobering because one of the things that he said about sea level rise is that most people, um, although on the one hand, the appreciation of the impacts of climate change amongst the public has increased exponentially, particularly in the last few years, um, as they see these unparalleled events happen around them. At the same time, people don't really have a true appreciation of what's going to happen no matter what we do. If we were to magically shut off carbon emissions tomorrow, um, there is so much carbon baked in that sea level rise would continue apace. Um, and one of the uh, cities that he, uh, that he examines uh, uh, extensively is Miami and uh, talks about how, you know, there is a certain amount of, of uh, fatalism at the same time amongst the development community. There is uh, not necessarily the acceptance of the economic impacts of what's going to happen. Uh, development continues apace. Um, and, you know, that's not uh, just Miami. I think there are other coastal communities that are needing to grapple with, um, with these changes. And again, uh, no matter what we do, um, our job now um, is to, uh, and we're getting to it in uh, Glasgow this week and next week is to mitigate to the extent that we can um, the worst impacts of climate change. Um, because now, unlike previous COPs, and COPs are you know, international bodies of the parties, conferences of the parties, that's what COP stands for. You know, this, this COP um, is notable in that there's more talk about adaptation as well as mitigation. You know, we've Paris Agreement was really about mitigation. I think over the ensuing six years from when Paris was uh, adopted, um, there's been more and more appreciation of the need for adaptation. And adaptation is going to cost money. Uh, on the economic aspects, uh, Roger, who um, we, our thoughts are with him, and his family. Uh, Roger and I uh, were at an event that I organized um, a bit ago in Seabrook with Congressman Pappas. 
And part of the purpose of doing that was to, at that event at that time was to draw attention to uh, the infrastructure bill, uh, the Build Back Better bill, uh, both of them that are still in Congress and hopefully we may see some uh, progress this week, at least in the House uh, on both of those things, I'm hoping. Um, but was really one of the things we talked about with, um, with Seabrook town officials, um, town manager, um, was specifically the wastewater treatment plant and what the fate of that plant is over the long term. Uh, not only uh, because of the expected flooding, but how does that uh, facility and other facilities like it that are vulnerable in Seacoast, uh, how, how is it that we essentially are going to harden them in, in terms of of what we need to do. And this is where the infrastructure bill comes in. Uh, there's money in there to do that. But we, the way we look at it is the infrastructure bill is a needed down payment. There's some very good climate related aspects in the infrastructure bill. There's the grid modernization that's very needed, the resilience. There's a lot of water quality uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure uh, funds in there. Um, there's electric buses. Um, things like that. But that really is only a down payment as to what we really need to do, uh, even with the, the pared down aspect of, of what we're seeing with the Build Back Better budget. But, but even now, um, climate uh, and energy investments are the largest part of the Build Back Better framework that was released last week, $550 billion that does an awful lot of things. Um, but we're going to need those resources. One of the things that Bill Manzi told us, the town manager of Seabrook, is, you know, there's no way that our community or any community on the seacoast is going to be able to take care of this facility or other facilities by ourselves. Yes, we can tax our residents and raise some of the resources, but there's absolutely no way that we can meet the challenge that we see over the long term with this infrastructure uh, alone. We need the partnership of the federal government. So that's why it's so very important um, to get these things done in Washington, because that's real money that's going to have a, a significant positive impact um, for the residents of the seacoast and to preserve the economic viability of the seacoast for years to come and, and its character. So that, that's very important. It helps to be unmuted. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask some of our um, elected officials or their representatives to um, offer a very, very short um, perspective on legislative action addressing climate change um, locally in the state and at the federal level. And I'd like to start out by asking Doug Marino, who will be representing Senator Maggie Hassan's office to say something for two minutes. Thanks so much, Sharon. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, well, thanks so much, everybody. I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be quick. I'm really glad to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Doug Marino. I work for um, Senator Hassan's reelection campaign. Um, I, I do work on the campaign side, not her um, official office. So I um, don't have um, all the answers, but my, um, but my colleagues were able to provide me with some really helpful information um, about what Senator Hassan has, has done in the past and also what she's currently doing uh, concerning climate change. So I'm gonna quickly run through those. Um, and um, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. So, um, uh, um, you know, Senator Hassan's commitment to combating climate change really goes back to her days in the state senate. Um, as a state senator, she sponsored legislation that brought New Hampshire into the regional uh, greenhouse gas initiative, also known as REGI. Um, and during her time as governor, she uh, built on these efforts by signing legislation to update New Hampshire's renewable portfolio standard uh, to uh, protect granted state ratepayers, invest in energy efficiency, and raise the net metering cap. 
um, since being elected to the U.S. Senate, um, she uh, successfully um, shepherded um, a bill into law called the Net Meter Act, which requires a national study on net metering to guide states interested in developing uh, development, developing um, effective net metering programs. Um, and she also led opposition to a proposal uh, before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that would have upended states' net metering programs. Um, and this is something that obviously has been an issue here in New Hampshire, and so she's continued to advocate on our behalf um, on this front. Um, she um, helped negotiate the bipartisan infrastructure deal, um, which works on measures uh, to increase funding for coastal resilience programs, uh, which is particularly important on the seacoast. Um, the deal also invests uh, in clean energy. Um, Senator Hassan does support reaching 50% clean and carbon free energy by 2030. Um, and she's uh, led a bipartisan group of colleagues in the Senate to support and expand programs such as Reggie to reduce um, harmful emissions. Um, and then finally, um, she's worked across party lines to pass uh, legislation to permanently fund key federal programs for conserving and protecting public lands and address the harmful maintenance back backlog. Um, so um, as you all know, Senator Hassan is somebody who works across the aisle. She's a consensus builder um, and we're really proud of her record in the Senate working with folks um, on both sides of the aisle to uh, protect New Hampshire's beautiful natural resources Sources and make sure that um, that we're combating climate change and protecting uh, our plan for future generations. Um, and as I said, I really appreciated the opportunity to be here with all you tonight to share some of uh, some information about the senator uh, about the senator's record. Thank you, Doug. Um, Tom Sherman, our state senator, would you like to say a couple of words too? Sure. Thanks. I was just bouncing around over to Greenland, so they all said to say hi and. I don't know if you all have been updated on election results very quickly, but Senator Hosmer was reelected mayor of Laconia and uh, Senator Kavanaugh was reelected alderman. So, so far, some good victories for Democrats. Um, <clears throat> in terms of climate change, I serve on the BOEM task force, which is looking at offshore wind. And while Sununo launched that, we have not met since he did. Um, which was, I believe, almost uh, three years ago. Um, so offshore wind is something that uh, David Waters is working very hard on in the Senate. And we continue to uh, try to get this legislature to recognize that. But I think as uh, Tom Laughman and the other state reps may know, there was some very bad news coming out of House uh, Science, uh, the House Science Committee where uh, the uh, uh, the bills on Reggie were pretty much um, stopped, um, the ones that had been retained by the House. And the chair of that commission, of that committee, um, really doesn't believe, I think it's Michael Vose, is that right, Tom? Uh, does not believe in uh, climate change or the, or man's connection to it. So, Politically, we need a significant change in 2022 to get back on track. Um, I did uh, get to tour the seacoast with Senator Hassan and uh, really appreciate her commitment to um, both coastal resiliency, um, but I am also working and uh, uh, Rob knows this, we working, we're about to launch or we have launched uh, healthcare workers for climate action. Uh, I serve on the advisory council for that. It's a dynamic group led by Bob Friedman, just doing great work to bring together all levels of healthcare workers to um, support all of the work that needs to be done on the connection between climate action and public and uh, clinical health. We will be having a formal launch on the steps of the Capitol on December 4th, I'm sorry, on the steps of the State House on uh, December 4th. And um, if uh, any of you want to go, it would be awesome to have lots of people there to support this action and this effort, especially if you have any connection to healthcare, um, since it is the same day as the Hampton Christmas Parade. Um, so that's uh, what I have in my two minute nutshell, we don't have a huge amount of legislation coming forward in the Senate on climate, except we continue to work to try to get us ready for an electric vehicle, uh, New Hampshire. 
Thank you. Um, can we go to Mike Edver Edgers, our um, state representative? Sure. Uh, you know, I really like to have, uh, be able to say there's a lot of good news coming out of the, the House of Representatives on this, but the only thing we can pray for is not to get too much bad news, um, depending on what kind of bills are brought forward, because no matter what is done, uh, the Republicans are going to get in what they want. And, and most of the time, it's, it's bad. What we can do is, uh, is work on uh, some of the, the commissions. And uh, you talk about, we were just asked to talk about two things which are somewhat separate, but some con somewhat connected. And, and that is uh, talking about uh, the, um, the effects of the, um, the different policies and procedures that we have for the drinking water. And then and also what we're gonna have for uh, the resiliency uh, to protect you know, Hampton Beach itself you know, from the rising tides. So uh, as far as the, like within the drinking water, um, we, we know that, you know, both Tom and Mindy were been vital over the years in a different capacities and still are, you know, relative to fighting for, for better standards and to get it recognized how bad we have it here as far as cancer goes. A lot of people still don't recognize that. And, and, and they've done an awful lot of work, hard work with that along the uh, and, and Rennie has also been involved, of course, and, and, and I tried to be. Um, some things are still going forward on that. Um, there was a couple issues that, that were brought forward that um, actually were real, they were real good. Uh, they were put in by uh, Democrats. So the Republicans canceled those bills and put in ones for themselves and, and passed them and made themselves look real good. But uh, we also have, uh, when we're talking about the resiliency, uh, you know, we have the Seacoast uh, uh, Commission, I gotta get, there's so many of them, a Coastal uh, Marine Natural Resources and Environmental Commission, um, you know, which I serve on. Um, it actually is trying to, uh, to do things along the lines of uh, getting people to recognize what problems we do have uh, on the coast. And sometimes you do get a chance to do just a little bit like in the uh, capital budget, we're able to, I was able to get in a little bit of money, a little over 300,000 to do a study on the sedimentation and other problems we have you know, on the seacoast uh, with the fresh water coming down um, and how it affects the ecology of, of the marsh and everything. So uh, that will be coming in, you know, be able to do that next year, but it's a little, little teeny bit of a tool that can help. And uh, Jay Diner has been involved in this stuff so much. Um, and of course he talked tonight, but. I don't know if you realize how much she has done and keeps uh, things uh, consistently going in the right direction uh, on what we need to do as far as recognizing the problems that we have uh, down at the, the beach, basically down, the, down, down along the coast. But the resiliency aspect, which hopefully is gonna be coming through on the federal side, um, could be a great benefit to, the, to us on the seacoast because it's potentially so expensive. Uh, there's so much that might, might have to be done on Route 1 we just don't have the money for it uh, ourselves. Uh, it's got to have money when you keep on cutting the taxes and there's no revenue, hardly any revenue. So, uh, but hopefully that will really, really be a benefit to us. Um, and, and over the next few years, that will really, really help, especially as we try to, to work out uh, the Ocean Boulevard, basically the, the Route 1A from the bridge uh, all the way down to High Street. And then you have to go up through Rye and the other places also, of course. But, uh, you know, we, we all realize, especially at high tide, what kind of problems we have. So um, that's, you know, some of the stuff I want to give us probably more than two minutes. And it was okay. kind of up between the two issues. But if anybody has any questions, you can get a hold of me. Um, Thank, Thank you. And we'll have time for more questions um, after Tom Lockman offers his, uh, his take. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I'm just looking at the Manchester results with one ward outstanding. She's Joyce Craig has it by 54% to almost 46%. So it looks like she'll be reelected. She is... was actually just declared the winner, Tom. Excellent. That's great news. Um, so one of the things, you know, just to add on to everything that's already been said is one of the things we can do with this anticipated influx of federal funds, even though we don't have the majority what little power we have is we can force conversations through bills or through amendments to bills. Um, and so 
you know, we can stipulate through amendments perhaps uh, how certain funds should be used. That way we're not leaving it up to uh, just the governor's discretion um, or others. So, you know, I'm interested in exploring ways we can do that. So as people like uh, Jay and Mindy and some of our environmental leaders find priorities uh, worth funding, you know, mitigations and adaptations, we can inject that into the conversation, you know, force vote. So that's one of the ways we can act on it in the near term. Yeah. I've got my little people coming in to say hello. I have to this that's okay. That's all I have to add on that. Um, there are some LSRs listed on the general court website. There's a new general court website, by the way, I posted it in the chat. There's something, Mindy, if you haven't seen it already, uh, a bill by Bill Boyd, an LSR by Bill Boyd, to rename the Department of Environmental Services and Department of Environmental Protection in assigning the Department Oversight of Private Drinking Water Wells. So I'd love to see the text on that. So one to keep up. That's it. Okay, thank you. So I would like to encourage you to ask questions. Um, panelists and speakers and, and leaders ask away of one another um, and anybody who is here ask questions. Do, if nobody has one right now, I have a few ready to go. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. Yeah, we've got we've got a few people that want to ask a question. I'll start with mm -hmm. Patty. Go ahead, Patty. Mine's a quick one. It's a thank you to our representatives and our <clears throat> office holders who are willing to work in the minority as hard as they are. We're so grateful. I know it's no fun when you don't have the uh, control. And I'm just really, really grateful that you guys stick at it. Thank you very much. I think everybody uh, everybody shares those sentiments, Patty. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I had a, a question um, and um, I was one, I think it's maybe a question, a question for Doug. Um, uh, Rob spoke about money in the um, infrastructure bill being available to help with things like wastewater treatment plants and Seabrook and Hampton. Is there any way to find out exactly how much money is in the bill that you know, would benefit the seacoast for those kinds of projects? Yeah, definitely, Chris. So I, um, I can um, get some more specifics from um, the folks in our official office. Um, and so um, I can get some uh, specificity there and um, uh, get back to you and um, you can distribute that information. Would that work? Yeah, I think that would be great because then we could incorporate that into some letters to the editor to really yeah. you know, make the connection between, you know, this thing that everybody's talking about in Washington and what it really means here in Hampton. And then yeah, I, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, Doug. Oh, oh no, sorry. Yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely, um, I'll definitely get back to you on that. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the details of the bill still aren't finalized right. yet. Um, right. but, but I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I have that information. Okay. And then I, and I guess it's kind of a, a follow-up question, um, for Jay, um, you know, we talked about um, Seabrook. Is Jay still on the call? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, he is. Um, it's good to see you again, Jay. Um, Thank you. You as well, Chris. So, um, you know, Rob talked about the Seabrook wastewater treatment plant. I'm assuming that the Hampton wastewater treatment plant has the same issues in terms My, of needing to be um, fortified. I don't think Hampton has the issues to the same extent that Seabrook does. Oh, okay. Um, but I, I, it depends on where we go with sea level rise as to the impact on on uh, Hampton's wastewater, <clears throat> excuse me, treatment plant. But I, I had a discussion with Chris Jacobs a few years ago when he was still director, and and we took a tour of the plant, and he talked about. Um, how different aspects of it were protected through elevation, through seawalls, uh, from the impacts of sea level rise, at least for the foreseeable future. So, this the feeling is that uh, we we are fine for now. Um, what about uh, what about yeah, the, oh sorry, go ahead, Chris. Uh, uh, I had a tour of the Hampton uh, septic uh, sewer system uh, of the plant itself with Senator Hassan. 
uh, about four to six weeks ago, and it is targeted to get funds to fully upgrade it, or at least make a huge dent in the needed upgrades from the um, infrastructure bill. So uh, she has, uh, that is very likely that Hampton is going to see the much needed upgrades to the plant itself. But there was no sense that the plant was under any imminent threat from sea level rise. Okay. What, what about some of the other public infra infrastructure, Jay, like the police station, fire station, mm -hmm. that type of thing? I think the police station is okay. okay. I haven't seen any indications that there is some, there is significant risk there from sea level rise. In 2018, when we had those two pretty significant storms, I was down on Brown Avenue across from uh, by the police station near the entrance to that new fire station at the, the beach fire station. And there was water up the ramp um, at, at the base of the door going into the fire station. Um, okay. So just based on that observation alone, I have some concerns about how resilient that fire station is. Yep. Uh, I don't know if there are inside the fire station some some uh, uh, features built in that will drain water that might uh, get into the fire station, but it's it's pretty close. And and Chris, we were um, I was able to get uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars to match a grant for the Hampton Beach Area Commission to address uh, environmental issues in their 10 year plan. So that should be, that will be incorporated into the 10 year plan for the Hampton Beach area. Uh, Nancy was working pretty hard on that and asked for that additional funding. So I would keep, uh, keep an eye out for that, specifically addressing some of the concerns of uh, resiliency in Hampton Beach. Okay, um, I've just, I'll go down the list of people that I see have questions. Erica. Yeah, uh, this question actually is for Rob. Um, actually, first, let me thank you for sharing the Climate Action Now signs. We really appreciate it for everybody's information. Those came from um, League Conservation Voters. And I, since you serve on the city council in Concord, and I believe that you have this uh, a commitment there that 100% of the city's energy will be renewable by 2030. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for Hampton as it considers its um, energy resources and how to start making them more green? Well, yes, in fact, I mean, I would, I would really promote the idea of having a resolution and making the commitment, number one, and making, you know, making a public commitment, an ambitious public commitment, um, as Concord and a number of other communities around the state have done, because it provides a roadmap. Uh, it's important to have that goal. On the policy aspect, I mean, one of the th things that is a positive that came out of the legislative session, the recent legislative session, was the increase in net metering from one megawatt to five megawatt for the cap uh, that applies to municipalities, school districts, counties, governmental units. Um, so what that means for Concord and other communities that is that we will be able to build larger projects. We'll be able to take advantage of economies of scale where we were not able to um, beforehand. Um, and it makes it much more financially viable to, buy, to build larger projects. Um, in Concord, you know, we're blessed that we have a variety of resources, one of which is um, uh, a hydro, small hydro, we have small dams uh, within the confines of Concord. We're gonna be able to net meter that in part to, to meet our electric needs for the city. The first step for any municipality I recommend is to get, get to a situation over time where you're completely offsetting your municipal electric use with renewable resources that's within your borders to the extent possible and under your control. Um, and that, that's, that's where we're heading, that's where many other communities are heading. Um, so, and I, does Hampton have an energy committee? We, we did, I don't know if we still do. It's important in terms of the, the way that you engage the public and build support ultimately to your you know, board of select persons uh, as decision makers, in, in my view. I think these energy committees have been a great success around the state and, and I would, uh, 
it's I would hardly recommend um, establishing one or reestablishing one if it's if it's sort of uh, gone by the boards a bit. It's very it's very useful. Builds public support and then political support for action. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I, I was looking for the hands up thing, but Chris was on before. If, if I could add, excuse me, you're Chris. Dick was on before, and he met, he was the president of the energy committee, and it, it dissolved because they weren't getting any support, and uh, they had proposed make some major proposals which were not taken up as far as going with renewable energy, some solar areas and, and stuff, but. Uh, so I don't know how much interest there is. I might find some other people that are, other people that are willing to do it. But the county is doing it. The county is going up yeah. to the maximum of five for our new county municipal complex out there in Brentwood. So uh, along with other federal money, it's paid for by federal money, and also to help uh, almost well to half fund the uh, the new municipal building from federal money. Well, yeah, and as a quick follow on, I think it's really, there's so much information out there that's useful and understandable and that can be communicated to decision makers about the economics of renewable energy and how municipalities can save money by doing this. And, you know, you don't have to always lead with climate, uh, but clean energy is an economic winner and hopefully that can also convince people to do it. Okay. Catherine, um, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I don't know if Rob or if uh, uh, Senator Sherman can answer this question, but what of the federal money that we talk about that could come for projects, mitigation or adaptation, et cetera, how much of that, which of that has to go through the executive committee? Because what's the risk of potential of the executive committee rejecting funds for climate in mitigation or for, for, for protecting our coast if they rejected funds for the COVID vaccines uh, distribution? Uh, Rob, if I could just jump in for a second. Uh, it, a lot of it does have to go through the executive council and Mike and I were at the uh, Gasset hearing last night at the seashell and the very opening line by our delightful executive counselor Stevens was how uh, the executive council had just approved $100 million of federal funding for um, these projects. And of course, she didn't mention that the all democratic federal delegation had gotten that money for her, but she did do that. Um, and Mike might be able to also chime in after Rob's done. Do you, you start to interrupt, but do you see a, uh, any kind of pattern what they are approving and what they aren't? Is it because this money is linked to I, I don't understand. What, why are they? Why is the executive committee rejecting that the, the COVID money for approving the hundred million? Do you, do you see? It? Would yeah, be a risk. No, the, the COVID the COVID funding is tied in their minds through their fringe hard right supporters to um, the presidential executive order mandating vaccinations, and that's that's the link that the people who wanted the 27 million rejected. It's not just because it's federal, it's it's because of this. Uh, and, and by the way, that notion was completely dispelled by the attorney general that it it's not, there is no connection with the federal mandates, but um, that's that's what they were claiming. So it's, it's apples and oranges. Um, okay. There's no reason to believe that they would turn down infrastructure funding, but the bulk of it will have to go through the executive council. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it would need to go through the executive council. Tom, you're right. The COVID situation is completely idea ideological. It's nothing to do with reality on the ground. Um, and, um, you know, to the extent that folks are looking for economic development, economic help, I can't imagine that the executive council would be as irresponsible to reject uh, money coming from the infrastructure bill. Um, if they do, then we're in another world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but uh, cities and towns would be able to also apply. I think once the money is approved, they would there would be a there'd likely be a process of um, you know RFP and application for funds and, and things of that nature. So well, we we have we have time for just a couple more quick questions. Um, Senator Levesque, did you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I want to thank everyone for this great presentation today. 
I loved hearing from the reps and those serving. And thank you so much for doing that in a difficult time. So heard a great suggestion about how you're giving out um, signs. And I'd like to know how I can get some signs. There's a, a lot. There's a, oh, well, you, uh, I think if, you know, if you were, if you were on the seacoast, you could click on our link and we deliver it to your house. Oh, I can actually, uh, like I Rob can probably talk uh, to you about it. Yeah. Cause the signs are, the signs are all coming from, from LCV. We, we have stood up a, a paid field program in addition to the, the robust staff we have on the ground here. And, um, if you just let me know where you want the signs and how many signs, um, I can arrange to have them delivered. I will do that. And can we let other people know this as well? Yes. Other groups? All right. Yes. Thank we you. have about 2,000 signs that have been cool. throughout the state at this point. Well, good timing. Thank you. Great. And, and then the last, the last question, she's been waiting very patiently, Amy Hansen. Or did I? No, I actually, Catherine asked the same question I was going to ask about the executive council. Okay. All right. Great. But wait, Rob, I can tell you, I got my sign two or three months ago. So I wanted to let you know that the ad, or I think I saw an ad on Facebook was effective because I've had Very mine good. in the yard for two or three months. So good work. Thank you. So we're going to, we're going to come back to Amy in a, in a, in a, in a minute, but I know I want to hand the meeting back to Sharon. Uh oh, I mean, I'm not muted. Okay, thank you. So what I would like to do right now is go back to each of the speakers and our leaders and ask each of you to offer the number one thing that we individuals or our municipality should do to mitigate the impact of climate change in Hampton and more broadly in the county and the state. Um, Jay, would you like, I don't know where you went. Um, if Jay is still, there you are. Um, would you like to lead off? Um, sure, my suggestion is, is a simple one and it's to keep talking to people, um, keep, talking to them and keep listening to them. If people have a concern about climate change, just listen to what that concern is and, and try to get into their head, um, understand what their perspective is and, and use their perspective and use their language to help them understand why taking steps to mitigate the impacts of climate change are gonna be in their best interest. Um, as with, as with uh, all the sea level rise and, and impacts of uh, high tide issues in, in Hampton. We've been talking to people about this for years and it's and talking to people has made a huge difference. And so it will with this issue as well. Thanks, Mindy. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about this really important topic. I can't say one thing, but <laughs> it's really hard to come up with one thing. Uh, so I'd say join Hampshire Safe Water Alliance on Facebook, join the conversation. Like Jay said, keep talking to people about how important these issues are. Uh, New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance will be putting out and New Hampshire Science and Public Health will be putting out alerts from time to time when um, there are places that we need advocacy help on some of the issues that are working through the legislature this fall. And we try to keep people generally updated on drinking water and climate change issues. So I'd love to have you join us. Thank you. Senator Sherman. Yeah, I, I would say uh, the top is to vote and you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I think Rob was there, the, the meeting of the ad hoc emissions commission after the 2022 vote, when everyone realized that we were on a trajectory to have, uh, uh, a zero balance by 2050 and all that came out of that commission um, after we lost all three chambers of the state house was to uh, form another commission, which by the way, died in the Senate. So vote, uh, get everybody to vote. It's so critical. Um, and the second one is practice climate change mitigation. Practice it in your homes and just make it a major focus of everything you do and be thinking about it. Because I think all of us practicing it, that's the way we end up battling this and bringing our neighbors along with us. Thank you. Uh, Representative Edgar. Uh, thank you. Well, 
I would say is to uh, is to talk to all your friends, all your neighbors, and start convincing people that there really is a problem. What I would say when when I get night to me, I say, ask the lobsters. They know they know this climate change. They know they're moving because of the temperature change in the water. Yeah. Um, so is, is it talk and try, somehow convince uh, again starting out with the people that you know because that they might be the only ones that will listen to us right now. It's hard to get anybody to listen and convince them. And in, in, in convincing them, of course, same time, you got to tell them to vote for Democrats because that's the only way we're going to get some of these changes. We've seen what happens when we're not in, you know, when we don't have the positions to make the decisions. Thank you, Representative Lerman. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I loved everyone's ad. So the only thing I'll say that's different than that is, um, you know, it does seem that people are more um, in agreement that climate change is happening and that it's caused by man or contributed to by man. And so even, even some folks on the right that were reluctant to agree to that see it now, but they're, they're also reserved to, well, what are we going to do about it? So I, I, I think the funds that we're expecting to get from the, fund, the federal level are a generational opportunity. And if we squander it, if we don't use those funds wisely for mitigation, for adaptation, we lose a tremendous opportunity. Now, I know we, we wish there was more that was happening, but uh, this is an opportunity. And I think, you know, we need to invest those funds wisely. So, you know, it's good to hear from folks like Jay and Mindy today on, on things that are very local to us, things we can advocate for. So when those funds come, uh, they get put in the right places. Thank you. And Doug, would you like to close out with um, thoughts from the center? Oh, he, I know he had another call that he had to take too. So Hi. back in Hampton. So, um, uh, um, Sherry, did you call on me? Yeah, I was wondering okay. if you could offer um, yeah. one thing we yeah. should all be doing. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, please support Senator Hassan's campaign uh, and uh, and support her reelection. But, but even bigger than that, I think that um, something that's so important is um, making sure that your friends understand the importance of local races and local elected officials. Um, we're really fortunate here in New Hampshire to have some really great um, representation at the federal level. Um, but unfortunately, at the state and local level, um, a lot of climate deniers um, have taken over positions of power. Um, so just make Make sure that your friends and family are aware of how important these races are and make sure they vote uh, for climate champions. Thank you. And thank you all for a wonderful, insightful presentation tonight. If you're wondering what else you can do now, let us know if you'd like that yard sign for a, at least the month of November and we'll deliver one to you. Complete the master plan survey. You can find a link to that on the Hampton website. Watch in the next week or so for an email with more links, references, and actions to take. Talk and vote. Climate change doesn't really care what party you're leaning towards, but some candidates address the issue, others run from it or worse. Vote like your future depends on it. And bring your family, your friends, and your neighbors to the polls. And that's it for climate change tonight in Hampton. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much, and and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, this was this has been a great um, a great presentation. So um, thank you, and uh, if you could all just um, hang on for a minute, we just have a couple loose ends to cover. <laughs>